hold your hand and every girl in the Ed Sullivan Theater wanted to do just that. Well, in 1964, that was what nice girls did. They held hands. To be honest though, if John, Paul, George, or Ringo wanted to perhaps give a girl, let's say, a kiss, I am sure that there would have been more than a few volunteers. <laughs> there was one band that seemed to be able to make young girls scream and melt all at the same time. The Beatles, of course. In the Beatles poems by Sharon Cartwright, we meet several individuals whose lives are affected by these musical sensations. Join me on a musical journey as I share with you how their lives were affected by John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Irritating, isn't it? When my daughter asked me to buy her tickets for the Ed Sullivan Show on February 9th, 1964, I had no idea what a beetle was. Old Ed knew, though. As I stood in the aisle on the 11th row of the theater, I saw Ed standing to the side of the stage and grinning like the Cheshire Cat. Now, I will say one thing, though. There is no way on God's green earth that those girls could have sang in the church choir the next morning with all that, that, that screaming. While mothers were infuriated with the Beatles, their daughters were infatuated with them. Hey, hey you, do you want to know a secret? Okay, so this morning, Holly called Kathy, who called Sarah, who called Betty, who after her mother grounded her for talking on the phone too late last night, called me. And Paul told Kathy, who told Sarah, who told Betty, who told me that Paul is dead. I said, I didn't even know he was sick. Well, then Paula phoned Kathy, who phoned Sarah, who phoned Betty, who after her mother decided that she was ungrounded, phoned me and told me that if you play the song, I'm so tired backwards, that you can hear the words. Paul is dead. Ugh. Well, then after lunch, Paula called Kathy, who called Sarah, who called Betty, who eventually called me and told me that it was all just a hoax. It was made up by some dumb radio station. But I told Betty, who told Sarah, who told Kathy, who told Paul that if it was true, that I would die. I would just die. And then Paula and Kathy and Sarah and Betty would all have to come to my funeral and play only Beatles music. While teenage girls were gossiping about Beatles hoaxes, younger and more hip parents were rocking out to tunes like We All Live in a Yellow Submarine. When I was younger, the Beatles infiltrated themselves into every aspect of my life. Via my peace sign, flower power, organic garden growing parents. My parents could have been the original poster children of the 60s. They owned every Beatles 45 and LP, and they even sang Beatles songs at Christmas. You see, my parents didn't actually believe in Christmas caroling, but that didn't stop them from going door to door and regaling our neighbors in what they referred to as year-round songs of peace and joy. As a tie-dye wearing young Tycho 7, I never had a tree house. Instead, I had a yellow submarine in a tree. My mother would quote Beatles song titles as though they were sage bits of advice and wisdom. For example, when fussing over something he saw in the news that night, my mother would look at my father and sternly say, Now, Dylan, let it be. Or when trying to capture a spontaneous moment on her newly purchased Polaroid camera, mother would pose us for at least 10 minutes and then smiling say, Act naturally. The Beatles would have loved my mother. The fall of my freshman year of college, my parents were killed in a car accident. They were driving home from a peace rally. When I think of them, and I do think of them, I remember them giving me permission to sleep overnight in my yellow submarine treehouse. Just before dawn, I'd hear them singing softly. Here comes the sun, doo 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 doo. Here comes the sun. I'd look out one of the yellow portholes, and there they'd be, holding hands, looking up at me, and smiling. And I'd sing back to them. It's all right. And they'd climb up the makeshift ladder, sit on top of my sleeping bag, eat oranges, and we'd pretend that we all lived in a yellow submarine. 
tragedy not only struck in the lives of Beatles fans, but also within the group itself. Last night, I found myself standing in front of the Dakota building, where John and Yoko had lived with their young son, Sean. It's hard to believe that just a few hours before, John's life was taken away by a man named Mark David Chapman, a man who claimed to have loved John Lennon. Last night, I found myself standing with literally thousands of others, where mourners had placed hundreds of flowers, drawings, pictures, and messages, turning the front gates into an impromptu shrine. It's hard to believe that just a few hours before, the man who his entire life had campaigned for peace, the man who was synonymous with love, died at the hands of a senseless and violent act. Last night, by 1 a.m., nearly a thousand people had gathered outside the Lennon's home. Young, old, black, white, we lit candles and sang, All I need is love. It's hard to believe. The Beatles had shaped a generation from the inside out, and now we had gathered together here, as if to some new holy place, expressing a primitive need to mourn. Last night, by 2 a.m., we were saying, all we are saying is give peace a chance. Surrounded by the glow of over a thousand candles, we gathered together to bear witness. It's hard to believe. We had always hoped the band, which had perceived innocence, which personified a restless idealism, would someday reunite. But now we knew the truth. John Lennon? John Lennon was dead. And so were the Beatles. I'm like all cotton mouth and I can't breathe. You made sense for a Mary Tally. Oh, Somewhere yeah, like my end was like crap. Ugh. Ugh. I need to Because I was like out of breath. Could you tell? I was like. <laughs> tell you right about. Tyler, are you still taping me? <laughs> Stop it. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Mm. I think this is going to help you tremendously. Um, okay. With your parents, the piece with your parents. That like that that is your best moment in the in the whole thing. My like you do, part. You I told you that's my favorite such poem. a good job with that poem. Like such a good job. So I think what needs to happen is you need to you pop too quickly out of that. You're like, oh my parents died. Yeah, I know. And then you're like, that was a lot faster oh, than normal. Well, the parents were dying. Like you're like really like you need to be like the narrator needs to take on that like somber tone. Like while the parent you know while all this happened. Then this happened because yeah, it's no. another bad event. That was weird, and like I have got a critique out of that actually. Like somebody said, um, your switch from the parents' death to the Lennon story, even though they spelled Lennon as in Bolshevik Lennon. Lennon. Um, they're like it's a little too sudden. Like give more time for emotion there, or make the transition more emotional, or something along those lines. Anyways, I think you're. And narrator. I felt it like that one was like oh my gosh, so much more sudden than maybe the other ones too. I was like, oh, your oh narrator is very like. <coughs> And it should be like newspaperish, like like almost like reporting. This is what's happening. But newspaper reporters do the same thing. When there's something right. exciting, they're like, "Oh, this is great." Oh, well, you got a like, newspaper reporter oh. thing out of though that you told me to do because you told me to act like I was yes. reporting something. Yes, but I want you to be tamed down. Like, well, this was happening. This was happening too. Okay. But I think the beginning of the John Lennon thing needs to be. Signed.